Brazil's transition to democracy took place somewhat gradually, amid a broader political change taking place across much of Latin America, many former colonies, and most socialist states. This historic moment, known by political scholars as the third wave of democratization, occurred alongside the end of the Cold War and marked an unprecedented triumph of liberal democracy around the world. In Brazil, this development was largely a product of efforts waged by unions and other civil society groups in the late 1970s and early 1980s, along with a series of reforms passed at the behest of its presence during this period. The governing style of the military regime, from the peak of its repression to its ultimate dissolution, evolved alongside the tactics employed by its detractors. The Brazilian armed forces seized power on March 31, 1964, ushering in a status quo of military rule that would take root in most South American countries by 1980. Early policies introduced under the junta, such as Institutional Act No. 5, enabled the president and his generals to dissolve Congress and waive nearly any constitutional constraints on their power. In Congress itself, the pro-government National Renovating Alliance, or ARENA, was ensured a comfortable advantage over its main opposition, the Brazilian Democratic Movement. The latter party was regularly marginalized and condemned under the accusation that it indulged in populist and utopian ideology due to its stated objective of establishing Western-style social democracy. President Ernesto Geisel oversaw limited democratic reforms in the late 70s, establishing indirect elections to high-profile executive roles and one-third of Senate seats. Despite these policies, Geisel successfully prevented the opposition from getting any meaningful political traction during his time in office. From the Vargas era through the 1970s, organized labor in Brazil was thoroughly incorporated into the federal bureaucracy. All disputes between employers and workers were settled in specialized labor courts, and the Ministry of Labor could prevent wayward union members from ascending to higher positions. Most unions were heavily centralized during this time, and independent forms of labor agitation were frequently suppressed. Individual workers were further discouraged from asserting their interests by an extremely flexible labor market, which enabled managers to reward and punish employees on the basis of conformity. However, declining real wages in the late 70s motivated greater numbers of union members to openly challenge their supervisors as well as the state itself. This first manifested itself in massive strikes, such as one in 1978 which boasted more than 275,000 participants in the Sao Paulo metropolitan area. For the next two years, workers regularly pressured their unions into negotiating for more generous wages, benefits, and conditions, refusing to operate as instructed until they received assurances that such negotiations were underway. Although the regime put an abrupt end to these actions in 1980, the crackdown served to galvanize millions of workers against military rule in favor of their own representation in the Brazilian political process. President Joao Figueiredo ushered in the beginning of the end of rule by the Brazilian armed forces, removing most forms of political censorship, easing state repression of unions, freeing all political prisoners, and allowing opposition parties and candidates to participate in fully free state and legislative elections for the first time in 15 years. These relatively liberal policies aligned with his pledge to restore democratic rule by the end of his six-year term, made immediately upon his ascension to office in 1979. Although persecuted dissidents began demanding punishment for their torture shortly after their release, public momentum behind these efforts stalled and a number of military officers emphasized that they would reassert control if anyone among their ranks were to be prosecuted for following previous orders or protocols. Successive reforms signed into law by these two presidents gradually eased restrictions on the range of opinions that could be disseminated through national media outlets, which had cooperated with the state in limiting criticism of the military and ruling party as much as possible since the passage of the Fifth Institutional Act in December 1968. Geisel began to reverse the censorship upon taking office in 1974, with the apparent intention of differentiating his administration from the more repressive policies favored by the armed forces. This pattern of liberalization continued during the reign of his successor, and its advancement was strongly correlated with the souring of public opinion toward the political establishment, which occurred over the same period of time. It is necessary here to acknowledge and discard some theories a passive observer might develop regarding what factors may have directly led to the end of military rule. Although one may speculate whether the inflation and poverty which afflicted Brazil in the decade following its economic miracle inflamed anti-government sentiments, the country's economic problems intensified more slowly than public dissatisfaction with its political system. Furthermore, a higher income level during the majority of this era was negatively correlated with support for the dictatorship. One might also posit that social structures directly turned public opinion against the regime through the distribution of anti-government propaganda to their members. Two particular institutions which provided a significant degree of high-profile opposition to the junta namely labor unions and certain left-wing contingents of the Catholic Church, might appear to have likely had a strong influence over their members' political opinions. However, opposition to the military government was actually weaker among self-identified Catholics and union members in the late 1970s than it was among the general population. This detracts the notion that most people who supported the opposition were simply directed to adopt their positions by individuals who were their superiors in certain hierarchical organizations outside of firm state control. Picaredo's immediate successor, José Sarni, had run alongside the late Tancredo Neves with the intention of becoming his vice president. While both candidates campaigned under the Brazilian Democratic Movement in 1985, Sarney had previously led ARENA and its direct successor, the Democratic Social Party, or PDS. His ascension to the presidency was facilitated by the Liberal Front, a splinter party of the PDS formed by a coalition of disgruntled military officers. 
Their condition for supporting Neves was the selection of Sarney as his vice president, as they prefer the two men together over the PDS candidate supported by most of their colleagues. Brazil's official transition away from military governance was therefore carried out, in part, by a dissident faction from within the incumbent class of military and political elites. The aforementioned facts would indicate that the assorted groups which actively undermined the junta in its later stages were diverse in their overall composition, predominantly middle class and secular, but inclusive of significant working class and religious components. This broader opposition movement could not have arisen in the same manner without the passage of successive liberal reforms, which enabled critics of the regime to organize and disseminate information concerning its failures, excesses, and hypocrisies. Presidents Geisel and Figueiredo, the moderate leaders who passed these reforms into law, were likewise vital actors in the initial thawing and eventual democratization of Brazil's political institutions. Finally, the role played by both the armed forces and former ruling party members in ultimately bringing the Brazilian democratic movement to power demonstrates the importance of elite participation in regime change and democratization efforts.